going to swallow up death forever. All those people crying will no longer need to do so because God will wipe away their tears. And this will happen for who? For anyone? Automatically? Left is here for who? It is for those who recognize him as their God and can say, we trusted in him and he saved us. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Now notice, if we go back, and yes, I think I meant you to go back, here the use of the word all. Repeatedly in these verses we see all. Notice here, a feast of rich food for all peoples. Not just for Indonesian people, or for Karo people, or for English people, or for just certain kinds of people, but for all people. And notice it's death for all people will be swallowed up. God will wipe away the tears from all faces. And this will happen in all the earth. Five times in this vision, as I emphasize, this is for all, not just for some, not just for those who sit here in the church this morning, but this is a vision for all. John, as we heard in the book of Revelation, has a similar vision, but he tells us about it in much more detail than Isaiah. First of all, we're told about the great multitude. Notice who these were and how many. It says, how many? No one could count. So many, it was impossible to count the number of people. Now, the Roman Empire at the time of Jesus was not too big to be counted, because you will remember the story of Jesus' birth, where there was a census, and they counted all the people throughout the Roman Empire. That was quite a lot of people, and they could be counted. So this must be much more than that. So many people. And they come from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Not just a few, but all. And they are wearing white robes, like our choir just now. I don't think that means literally that everyone in heaven will have to wear white robes. I guess that there will be people wearing batik and many other colourful clothes. I think the white rose is a symbol of purity. Sometimes people who are baptised wear white robes as a symbol of their sins being washed away. They're being cleansed from sin. So don't take that too literally. And holding palm branches suggesting excitement, victory. Think of an election campaign, people waving, banners, flags, lots of excitement. Again, I don't think we have to take the palm branches too literally, but let's get the picture, let's get the feel of what's happening there. And they're chanting. They're not shouting out the name of um, a presidential candidate or the party to be voted for, but their theme is salvation. Belongs to our God, sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. This is the end of history. And they look back on history and they reflect on thousands or millions of history years, the most exciting thing that has happened in all that time is this. Salvation. Belonging to God. 
and to the land. Well, who are these people? Is a question that John asks. John, who is having this vision on the Isle of Patmos, and uh, one of the elders who are there asks him, well, who are these people in white robes? Where did they come from? And John says, well, you know, best of I don't tell me. And this is what he says. These are those who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, at a big festival like this, it's not always easy to get in. There may not be enough seats or enough standing room. You may have to queue a long time to get tickets. In the town where I live in England, Cambridge, one very popular event is the festival of nine lessons and carols. The Christmas service which is held every Christmas Eve in King's College Chapel. That is broadcast throughout the world. And it's not a very big chapel. And although the service takes place in the afternoon, people start queuing, even in the middle of the winter, six o'clock in the morning. It's maybe snowing or raining, but they're already queuing to get there, to get in to this special service. And for big important things, it may not be easy to get in. So the important question here for us to know and for us to be able to share with other people is how to get to this great festival. Do you just turn up and walk in? Or do you need a ticket? Or how do you do it? Well, notice here what it says. The answer, when John asks, is the people there are those who have come out of great tribulation, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Again, literally, that doesn't make very much sense. If dirty clothes are washed in blood, do they come out clean? Well, normally not. But here, this is a symbolic description of what happens when people are dirty, when people are sinful, when their lives are a mess, when they are walking in darkness, to use various images that we find in the Bible, that the light of the world shines in the darkness. The blood of the Lamb can make dirty clothes clean. Sins that we have committed in the past, great or small, can be washed away by the death of Jesus, the Son of God, on the cross. This is the heart of the Christian faith. John previously wrote a gospel before he wrote this vision. And in his gospel, right at the beginning, he talks or writes about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A picture for Jesus. An image referring to the Old Testament when it was common to sacrifice lambs for the forgiveness of sins. And so Jesus, although a human being and not literally a lamb, sacrifices his life for the salvation of others. And then we get a glimpse of heaven. What would it be like there? You've heard it, you can see it here. There's good reason to get excited about this. What do we see? Some of the key elements. Verse 15. God's continual presence. God will be there. Verse 16. Plenty to eat and drink. We won't get hungry there. That's good news. And a pleasant climate. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. 
we want to make air conditioning in heaven. Or central heating in heaven. The climate will be just right. Maybe that's slightly exaggerating to interpret in that way. But I think it's an indication of the fact that the conditions in heaven will be designed to be a comfortable place. Food, drink, a nice climate. And Jesus himself will be there in verse 17. He will lead them in person. He will be their shepherd, will lead them to springs of living water. We often drink spring water here. Back in 1977, when we came to Indonesia, we didn't often have spring water. We took ordinary water, we boiled it on the stove, and we waited until it cooled down, and we could drink it. Nowadays, everywhere, you buy aqua or similar kinds of spring water, fresh water, convenient and tasty. Well, there will be springs of living water in heaven, we're told. And perhaps most important of all, no more pain and suffering. Again, we're told, as in Isaiah, God will wipe away his children's tears. So two great visions of the future. Vision of the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, the vision of the prophet, the apostle John in the New Testament. Well, do we have a vision? Have you got a vision? It's a blank slide here. It's not because I've forgotten or run out of material. Deliberately. But it's just a question to encourage you to reflect. Isaiah had a vision. John had a vision. Do you have a vision? Do I have a vision? What do we expect in the future? What do we hope for in the future? Are we looking forward to the sort of thing that Isaiah and John were looking forward to? But you know, visions don't happen by themselves. If we have a vision for something, it usually means we have to work for it. We want something, we hope for something, we can imagine something, but we have to work for it. It may take weeks, it may take months, it may take years. I remember meeting someone who lived in the northern part of Thailand. They'd been there for many years. They had a vision that the Bokaran people, tribal people in northern Thailand, would believe in Jesus, the very gospel. Year after year, they lived there in a small village, they shared the good news, and it seemed nothing much happened. But they kept on going. They had a vision. And one day, the church was all there. The people from that group, that tribal group, began to worship God in the name of Jesus. Their vision began to become true. Well, I'm not just going to leave it as a question, but I'm going to give you four practical suggestions of what we can do to bring this vision about. And all of them are based on things that we see in the Bible. The first thing is to go. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said later, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus said, go. Now what does that mean for us? 
Where should we go? How should we go? Should all Christians get out of church, leave the churches and go elsewhere to preach the gospel? Well, maybe not. If everyone became a missionary, there would be no one at home to support them by prayer and giving. No one to care for the poor and to serve the needy here at home. I'm quite sure God doesn't want everyone in this church to go. On the other hand, do you think he wants no one to go? Maybe we can spare one or two or three people to go somewhere else to preach the gospel. Now, the people among this church have in the past certainly been to share the gospel. And you don't always have to go a long way. When you do this, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You may not have to go very far. Starting in Mecca, that is now Jerusalem. It may only be walking next door to talk to your neighbour or to the person who works next to you in the office or the person who sits next to you in school or maybe just a member of your own family. But for some, it may be going further, going elsewhere in Sumatra, maybe going to other parts of Indonesia, or even further than that, to other parts of the world. Some of you are young people, maybe you haven't yet decided what you're going to do with your life. Have you ever considered becoming a witness for Jesus in some other part of Indonesia. Consider it. Why? Because Jesus said go. And therefore we should consider whether that command is intended for each one of us. But that's only one thing to do. The second thing is to send. Maybe you can't go yourself, or maybe God is not calling you to go, but you would send someone else. Some of you are older, maybe you've got a child or a grandchild. You could say to them, how about you go to share the gospel somewhere else, another part of Sumatra, for instance, and I will support you, I will pray for you, I will help cover your expenses. That's something you can consider as an older person. That's something as a church or as a group we can consider. Send other people. There are many missionaries out there in different places sharing the gospel. But they grow old. They get sick. They have to return home for one reason or another. And we need an ongoing supply of people. You might consider looking around to find someone who is suitable and ask them to consider whether God is calling them to be a witness for Jesus somewhere else. There's a third thing that you can do without having to go or even send. And that is to invite. This is from the first part of John's Gospel. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. That was what Andrew did. Now, that is quite significant because Simon Peter, more often known as Peter, was one of the most significant of the apostles in the New Testament, one of the leaders. And he also went preaching the gospel in many places. We don't read much about Andrew. 
we might forget about him. But here we see Andrew's role was very important. He was the one who first introduced Simon Peter to Jesus. And if he did nothing else in his life, he did something of the most important step. And you can consider that. Who is that? You can invite to get to know Jesus. You might not know what to say. Well, you can invite them back to church. And then you don't have to say anything. Then you listen to whoever is speaking say something. You can invite them to a small group. Or you can get a book from the bookstore and give it to them to read. There are various things you can do. Invite someone. And a fourth suggestion to pray. The great Apostle Paul, perhaps the greatest preacher and missionary there ever has been, did not do it on his own. He did it with the help of colleagues, with the help here we see of those who prayed for him. He asked for prayer. Pray for us too, that God may open the door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Every week here at church, there is a mission of prayer. That's very important, because those people who are involved in mission need your prayers. For them, life is probably much more difficult than it is for you. They're facing all sorts of challenges, all sorts of difficulties, and they want to be faithful the word of God, to the calling of Jesus. So pray for them. Keep on praying for them. And apart from that, there may be other ways to pray. Pray for individuals. Pray for organizations who are reaching out. If you don't know what to do, do talk to a pastor. Go to Pippa. Talk to people else. She could advise you if you would like to pray for those who are sharing the gospel in other places. These are different ways that we can work together to bring about this great vision. In one way or another, by going, sending, inviting, praying, let us work together to bring about this great vision. I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They cried in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. How many there in that great celebration will be there because of you? Thank you, Father, for these wonderful visions. Please help us to know what part you want us to play in bringing them about.